setting. Yeah. There we go. Let's okay, do it. So this is practical deep learning for coders lesson, not chapter, lesson 12. Um, the chapter lesson title is mean shift clustering. And there is some of that in here somewhere, but <laughs> it's not the, the dominant thing. He actually starts out talking. Let me share my screen here. Or my notebook window, if I can find it. Lesson 12, there we go. Hopefully that works. Hopefully you can see my uh, notebook now. Yep. So he starts out this time, actually a relatively short section uh, on other other things going on, where he talks about this clip interrogator. I guess one of the students told him about it or something. Anyway, he talks a little bit about that. I don't plan to spend any time at all talking about it unless somebody has something to, to say about it. Put some notes in here, but um, the basic idea was that it could take an image and then try to produce some kind of prompt that you might be able to use to get an image of that style and of that subject, I would say, right? It's not gonna be that image, obviously. You can't put a picture of Aaron on there and say, hey, give me the prompt that generates Aaron. Uh, not yet anyway, I'm sure someday, but, uh, but no, actually he said it's basically impossible, right? Cause it'd be like, it'd be some kind of perfect, uh, it would be a violation of the physics of entropy, right? You have, you can't encode an image of Aaron in so few bytes as a few, par you know, even a paragraph of words, right? There's not enough information in that. So that's not, not something you can actually do, but it is very useful if you want to have, oh, I like the style of this picture and I want to produce something like that. It seems to do a pretty good job of that. And it does it by using this uh, blip model, which is designed to generate captions for images. And then it combines it. I looked at the source code. You can look at it. You can see it has, like he said in the video, it has all these hardwired uh, sets of artists and styles and movements. And it just tries basically them all <laughs> and, uh, and evaluates how well they match to your image using Clip, which Clip, that's what Clip's designed for. Clip's designed to tell you how well text prompt, it, you know, makes uh, embedding for the text and embedding for the image and tells you how close they are. So it just gives you the the one that's closest of all the things it tries, the blip plus all these extra pieces it, it generates. So it's pretty cool, pretty interesting, but yeah, uh, some of the text that was generating back though was kind of offensive, you know? It's like, man, I wouldn't want to... I don't remember that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like high Give forehead. Kind oh, of, that, you know, right, yeah. Offensive in that way. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Insulting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> For him, it did say that, right? <laughs> they may have updated. It seems like they have updated a bit since then, but I don't know if it does much better. But any event... If you ever need that, I think there might be other better ways to do this now, too. I'm not sure, but I think I saw somewhere for sure. I thought I saw somewhere there was a way. There was another model out there that was that was able to generate like better prompts, like long paragraph prompts, including like shutter speeds and everything else uh, from an image to get images in that same style. But the other way, oh, I actually know what it was. There's a I think he did have this linked in one of the earlier lectures. It's a website where people have posted their images and their prompts, and then you can try to find images you like that are close to what you want to do, and you cut, you know, just basically steal their prompt and change pieces of it. That's what it was. That's kind of the old school way of doing it, mm -hmm. brute force, but that's that's available. Anyway, I said I wasn't going to spend much time, and I'd already spent too much time on talking about clip. That's <laughs> I lied. <laughs> um, so the, so now uh, I can now we can also see why he didn't spend too much time on other things at this lecture because he realized at some point I think hey I'm on the I'm on lecture lesson twelve I still haven't finished the first notebook yet <laughs> so he goes back relatively quickly into the notebook uh, to finish the matrix multiplication bit um, so that's what this is so I import uh, all the necessary libraries I just, I just repeat here uh, the loading of the the uh, the MNIST data. Um, that he did at the end of the previous one, because I, this is, I don't know how the whole notebook here, I just took the end piece of it, and as much of that code as I need to re get back to the same spot. Uh, so we take those, so he, you know, the training and the validation sets um, are loaded in from, with this special MNIST module, uh, then convert them to tensors, we want them to be PyTorch uh, tensors, right? Uh, it's mapping torch a tensor across that tuple, right? Uh, and use this structural, what are they, what's he call this again? Destructuring or something like that. There's a name for it. I forgot, but uh, to be able to assign to the, the every tuple at the same time, uh, then generate some random weights and biases. So these are 784 pixel images, um, and we're going to generate uh, 784 by 10 matrix right for this. 
uh, or I have to only have 10 units or whatever you want to call it in the layer. Uh, and then from that, we take only 10 images just for a smaller set. He calls that M1, and the weights are still M2, right? So we're going to take from the images, X, I did X valid here for some reason. I guess it doesn't really matter. I'm taking only 10. But um, take 10 images, and we're going to use those for the initial uh, analysis so it doesn't take so long. As we'll see, it does take a long time for if you do naive multiplication uh, for the full training set. So this again, this is just review. This is the brute force triple loop version where you calculate each and every uh, element one at a time. And this takes a long time. But one thing I found is it doesn't take as long as it took. Um, so I just did it 20 milliseconds. When he was doing it, it was take a 500 milliseconds. And I found out, that, found out the reason was he wasn't, he's using NumPy, stop with these pop-ups. He's using NumPy um, in here, right? NumPy zeros, so these are all NumPy multiplications. So every single time when they did this row, it's converting the TensorFlow, or sorry, the PyTorch tensors back to NumPy arrays. And so you uh, convert them first, it doesn't take anywhere nearly as long. So instead of 500 milliseconds, it's 20 milliseconds. So that kind of gets back to your, I think you're coming in the Slack channel, right? Where you kind of yeah. reproduce I'm, the same thing in R and you were getting a, just like this naive implementation. Yeah. Right. R is actually faster than this with a naive implementation. But huh. I think that might have to do with the fact that R is more dedicated toward doing that. Kind of, like this is still somewhat general. Um, this is still using somewhat general lump uh, Python thing. So it's probably still carrying lots right. of baggage around. Um, and it might be reallocating these late arrays as it goes. I think I've got to go a little faster. I don't have it in this note, but if you put in a, uh, you save every row, you cache it, then it goes like, it's down like five milliseconds. I can't remember exactly how I did that, but somewhere he just uh, cached the, uh, A R I or something like that, and save it. Then it won't recompute it every single time. Mm. It's always a trick. Yeah. And so then, skipping through all the rest that we did at the end of last week, we finally got to the broadcast version, which was the fastest we got so far. So we got that down to 100 microseconds. That's about 150 times faster than the naive version. Still faster, but not nearly as much faster as. That's what he was applying. And again, the trick here is to just do, uh, to, for each row in the first matrix, we're going to calculate the entire top row of the output matrix all one time by using broadcasting, because we just copy that row down over and over, and over again and multiply it uh, by that, each column, right, over and over again, and then sum up the appropriate way to get that row all, one, all at once, which is kind of cool. And that's as fast as we got so far. Uh, and I just, for the fun of it, I did the full, I didn't put it in here, I did the full uh, training. I went back to the training, do the training uh, set, the full training set, right? Times my temp, my my weights, right? All at one time, it took a minute using the naive thing. It was slow, it's very slow. You couldn't train with that. One minute per gradient step would be difficult, but it's not as bad as it would have been without the conversions. And if we use instead the, um, uh, the broadcasting version, which is what this is, it's much faster. Like, like actually, that's still not, that should be faster than that, right? Oh, no, because now we're dealing with the, yeah. So it's still about 200 times faster than the naive version. But this is doing the whole thing. So now it's a, now it's a half a segment. Now we're doing all the images. Yeah. How, still how big was slow. the training set? I don't remember. Yeah. Um, did, I, did I shape it up here? No, we could do that. Whoops. <laughs> don't want that. Why is that button there? <laughs> Eleven. Let's skip that. I'll delete that later. Uh yeah. Fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. Okay. Yeah, fifty thousand right. images. Yeah. So it's still way too. I mean, it's fast, but it's way too slow for us to do. I mean, it's not. I mean, you could do training with this. You just have to have a lot of patience, I suppose. Right. Then, so then he thought. Now we have a little digression about Einstein summation, which is a way to express everything in uh, basically in one expression that then is implemented in C code. So we can get everything down to the C code speed. And so just to explain this, this what this, what this is is a compact representation for combining sums of products in a very general way, right? And it comes from actually Einstein's work on general relativity because his work involved lots of tensors, being you know, tensors for the space-time geometry being multiplied by other tensors for the, um, uh, the stress energy tensor and all these things, it started to get a little unwieldy how to put this sum here every single time. So he invented the convention, well, I'm just going to leave out the sum, but if you ever see two indexes repeated, I'm summing all those indexes. 
And in physics, that's just, that's very common now. That's a standard mm -hmm. way to write these kinds of things in physics expression. You just leave out the summation. And if you just, it's always assumed you see two repeated indexes, that's being summed over. Uh, so in NumPy and also in PyTorch is the NumPy syntax. They've captured this and kind of generalized it a bit uh, in this function Einsum, Einstein summation. And the rules are generally, are just basically this. If you repeat letters, between input arrays, that means we're gonna multiply those along that dimension element-wise, right? And the other rule is if you don't uh, put the letter on the output, then we're gonna sum up over those. That's the only way you can get rid of the letter, right? So we're just gonna sum up over that particular index. And that's the most common thing that you, that you would do with Einstein is you're gonna multiply element-wise and then sum it up. And that's what matrix multiplication is. That's what this expression up here is, this matrix multiplication, right? We're multiplying element-wise and we're summing up. Here, the element wise summation uh, multiplication is somewhat straightforward, but that's that's what it means. But you can express many uh, matrix multiplications with this thing. For example, I transpose, you can just do this, right? Ij goes to Ji, or you can just actually just, when the cases when the uh, uh, when the input is obvious, there's a shorthand. You just type Ji, and it'll just assume you meant Ij for the input. There's a bunch of shorthands like this. I forget all the rules, but they generally kind of work how you might expect them to work. If you want to do the inner product, you can do this so between two vectors or two anything really. Um, the trace, this trace means multiplying along the diagonal. That's um, can be done that way. And then finally, of course, matrix multiplication, which is expressed this way, which is what we're trying to do, right? So uh, we just so he does this I sum by, uh, version, and then now we're down to seven milliseconds. So that's another factor of what again. Yeah, this is the full uh, matrix, right? The full fifty thousand thing. So where we are, we were at half a second before, now we're down to seven milliseconds because now it's all being in C. That's for the full thing again, not to confuse with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. And I did write this in C just for fun of it, the loop, and it does take about you know eight milliseconds to run the matrix multiplication in C. So that's it's not doing anything beyond just running everything in C, as far as I can tell. They mentioned things like it's using the uh, what's it called, LAPAC library and things, but. Whatever optimizations those are don't come into play for this particular <laughs> multiplication. Like, the, no. Those linear algebra yeah. libraries, the standard yeah. ones. Yeah. Right. Uh, let's see. I think I'll save that matrix on you later. Finally, there's no need to use Einstein if you're really just going to do matrix multiplication because there's a built in operator for this big surprise. <laughs> so the built in instead of a multiply, you just use an at and it does matrix multiplication. It doesn't so, uh, NumPy use the the at symbol as well? Yeah, NumPy you know, does too. Yeah. So if you have both loaded at the same time, I guess does it does it matter? I mean, is that oh, gonna screw know. things up? It like, is there a conflict there? I think one might. Oh, that's does one. I know in R it always warns you if you shadow things. If, if, uh... Yeah, yeah. Being a primarily an R user, I always think that's that's always a recipe for disaster, right? Yeah. Uh, but okay. It, it, I mean, we didn't, well, you have NumPy loaded in here because you, you were converting things to NumPy, right? Or was that, was that a, oh, well, okay. <laughs> this is actually not that difficult. I just remember what's going on here. It depends on what the types of these things are, right? So Python, uh, right? Yeah. This, the NumPy this array is, this is an overloaded thing. operator. So it, sure. this, this yeah. is actually calling a method on the NumPy mm -hmm. array or on the TensorFlow array. So that's how it knows which one you're, you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So at similar see one of those operators you can overload with a dunder. You do it like uh here. Like this, I think probably. You know, I don't know. Answer, you know, it's probably somewhat oh hey, maybe just look this up. Answer. Well, yeah, because the add is a shorthand for the, the matrix multiply, right? Oh, that's not correct. Removed. <laughs> what is it? Oh, okay. What? Oh, well, I don't know. Here's not in there. Pretty sure it is, though. What do I call those things? X trains. Bye. Maybe that doesn't work because the way it uh it overloads that operator is not in the most straightforward way, probably. 
Oops, I don't have that. That works, so never mind. I don't know. Anyway, it's overloaded for the type. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And those were the, you were just doing the NumPy arrays there? Yeah. Yeah, just yeah. Just checking it worked. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to move this window somehow. All right, so finally we can move all this onto the uh, GPU. Uh, and the GPU is designed to do lots and lots of matrix multiplications in parallel, and mainly was developed originally for doing 3D graphics, but then people started using them for other things first, I think, uh, for Bitcoin mining was one of the first applications of GPUs that wasn't directly related to uh, computer graphics, but now we're using them for, well, I guess it, you can't really use them for Bitcoin mining anymore, they're too slow. You have to use a dedicated hardware now, but uh, we can use them for, Major multiplication for other things like TensorFlow or PyTorch and uh, TensorFlow, right? So, uh, so he goes into a little digression, which I think I might just skip over about why this can be parallelized, right? So, I, I'll, I'll, I kind of copy this code in here. The idea was that hey, at each particular element, right, uh, in the output array, we could we could compute each element in parallel, which seems obvious to me, right? It's just the multiplication of these two. Uh, the inner product of the particular row in a particular column, we can do those all in parallel because they don't depend on each other. So I'm going to kind of skip over this part, but that was the key insight. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that first function was just multiplying two two numbers together, right? To get yeah. one one well, piece two, of the, two, the yeah. final matrix product. Two yeah. vectors uh, inner product, but yeah. A row and a column to get the output number, to get the single number. To get the single number, right. But since you have multiple processors on the GPU, you can assign each one of them to do this for each or group them up so each one is assigned for some subset of those and speed everything up. But I couldn't reproduce, I, I don't have the CUDA development environment on here that you need or the toolkit you need to be able to use the Numba CUDA stuff. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to try to get that working. Just to, for this one little demonstration, I'm just going to skip ahead to just, you know, the easy thing, which is, you, hey, you guys, throw these things on the CUDA device <laughs> and multiply them together. Yeah. And you see, you know, it takes only 30 minute microseconds. Well, I'm doing 50 to get uh, some statistics. So I did run into some weird problem, though. You might, might see it now because, like, when I'm doing video, like I'm talking with you guys, the video, my video processor is doing too many things at one time. And it sometimes could take too, it'll say, it'll probably will come with an error saying that there was a, um, Wait, what did I just do here? What does this say? Cuda version. This one says Cuda version. Oh, okay. Because I'm because here's I'm using the. Uh, this is using Einsam, right? I don't know why it's taking so long. I think it's probably going to tell me that it had some. You know, some of them took a lot longer, which means that something went wrong and shoving stuff back and forth in the GPU. So I. <laughs> That's why I had a little noise. Sometimes you get outliers that are slower. So I don't have to Python garbage collector because I have video things going on in the background or whatever. But nevertheless, uh, the important thing is right here when I do move on to the, the, the GPU and multiply, uh, the use the use the uh, PyTorch operator, it takes 11 microseconds. So that's a lot faster uh, than our, well, it's a thousand times faster, right? <laughs> it was about 10 milliseconds, now it's about 10 microseconds. Uh, hold on a second. So you're you're uh oh yeah, yeah, you're right. You use the X train there. Yeah. Because I'm I'm looking at the cell above, it looks like you're multiplying with the validation set, right? But then well, I actually just made it there's um, it really is. Oh, you just renamed it. I see. Yeah, that was a mistake. Okay, there. got it, got it, got it. So well, no, now I know why this isn't working. Because <laughs> I didn't actually move it. This is doing the this is doing it. This is doing 50 of the slow ones. This could take a while. I better stop this. Because this typo means I'm still, um, no, it should be all right. Even though I obliterated the extra. I don't know why this is taking so long. For a minute there, I thought I did, but I don't. Because I still say valid here. No idea what's going on there. But nevertheless, it's, when I did it with with uh, out being on Zoom, <laughs> it worked fine. It was 11 microseconds, yeah. so it's much faster. Okay. So I do want to interrupt this, though. Just fix this for the future.
Oops. I'm not going to write it again now because it was just, there's, I'll do it offline and make sure it still works, but there's a thing clear. Hang on. Okay. Get rid of that. Um, like I said, occasionally, oh yeah, so I do this, like I was seeing even outliers here, so I did like a little history. I'm like, mostly it takes a very short time, but there's occasionally the weird outliers that take a long time to run. I don't know why. So that's something I just did for myself to try to understand what's going on there. Okay, so that's matrix multiplication sped up by a factor of basically a billion. It still turns out in the end, it's a factor of a million uh, or more speed up from the, the native of the Python. Yeah. Which makes a huge and, difference when you're doing training, as you can imagine, right? And, and you're using, um, is it like a local GPU or you're, you're you? Yeah, using it's my local space? GPU. Okay. So that's why I'm saying it's probably because I'm on Zoom and the GPU is working on that. And I've got a bunch of windows open and who knows what else is going on. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, like what, what kind of All GPU right. are you running locally? Um, I forget. Is there a simple way to find out what it is? Is there a Python command for that? I'm sure there is. Uh, I was just curious, like how much how much uh, GPU memory you had. You no, know, my my laptop has eight. I think it's like a twenty seven hundred series. Uh, yeah, graphics card. Let's see if I can. There you go. <laughs> GeForce RTX 3060 Ti. I don't know how much memory it has. Maybe that's in the capability string. You can look that up. I don't know what that means. 86, whatever. Properties? It's uh, uh, total memory. It there you like, go. Nine it looks like, Oh, nine. Nice. Processors. Okay. Eight major, six minor, whatever that means. Yeah. It, <laughs> Google Google says it's eight, which is what I have on my, my laptop too. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, that's the version number, I guess. Okay. Cool. Huh. That's kind of neat. All right. Anyway, back to uh, mean shift clustering. So, oh, sorry. The new topic now is mean shift clustering. What's the point of this? Why do we care about mean shift clustering? We don't, right? I mean, maybe we do, but we don't. That's not the point is not to teach us a new method which seems like kind of out of the blue is like oh now the next the most important thing to know about is mean shift clustering that's not the point of this the point of this is an exercise to uh to stretch our abilities on uh using broadcasting and uh, element wise operation and einstein summation that's the the reason for him going through this at all uh so but nevertheless he wants us he, you know he said hey we pick this algorithm also because it's kind of a fun algorithm and something you may not have heard of i haven't heard of it i'd never heard of k-means sure other things but uh I never heard of this mean shift thing. It's kind of neat though that doesn't unlike K means you don't need to know K, right? He'll figure it out for you. I don't know like what I don't I haven't looked up or tried to understand when you would find K means to be better than this mean shift clustering algorithm. Maybe have to do with how big K is and how you know, maybe K means is faster for some things. I don't know. But does anyone know the answer to that? Like anybody use this? No, no, but I mean, you still have to, uh, what, specify the bandwidth or whatever, so I guess that's, that's right, there's, there's another parameter still, right? That's maybe something you still would want to want to tune, play with. Right, so instead of K, you have to deal with the bandwidth, so maybe it's, you know, depends on what you have more knowledge about. Uh, so, let's see, I guess I need to re don't need to re-import these things, but I will anyway. So he generates this synthetic data. I'm not going to like go over this, uh, what he does here. He does spend a little bit of time talking about this multivariate normal function. And Forch has one, NumPy has one, SciPy has one. Um, they all have different syntax. You just have to look them up or ask ChatGPT or whatever your preferred method yeah. is. Um, hey, hey, real quick, you may not know the answer to this, but uh, you know, I just watched the video once through and I was trying to understand the kind of those hard-coded math, uh, th th those numbers kind of in that cell with the centroids. Yes. Like why is he multiplying by 70 and then subtracting 35? Do you do you, do you recall where that's coming from? So he these, these are random, uniform random points between 0 and 1, right? 
originally. These are centroids, right? So he picks random uniform points, uh, an array of, of six of them. Six by two, right? Because it's two, you need an X right. and Y coordinate, right? right? And then so he's I like, okay, that. I don't want them. I don't want them centered at zero. I don't want them. I want them to be more widely spread, right? Uh, oh, so, oh, I see. So I multiply okay. by yeah. seventy to spread uh, them out. Both uh, dimensions. Yeah, the same he's, he's rescaling it. And then I he see it. Centers it. Uh, yeah. Right, so okay. Zero zero again. I got it. More or less. That makes right? sense. But gotcha. Gotcha. On average, centered on zero zero. Like. Okay. That's that's why he does that. Yep. Yep. Okay. So that's that. These are like not very. Did I run this? Yeah. These are not. These are. I mean, he made it somehow a super easy case here, right? I mean, there's not very much overlap between these centroids, so I'm not so surprised that it works so well for him. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to matter what kind of kernel he uses or anything. I'm like, well, I'm not too surprised. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, the goal then is to start with just the dots. You don't know the centroids, and we're going to try to find the centroids. And the way it works uh, in a nutshell is to, for each, well, let me just go, for each point, like each point, like this green point right here, uh, we find the distance from this point to every other point in the in the data set, uh, and then weight them by their distance in some way. And if you use the Gaussian kernel, we can use some other kernel. He chose also uh, just a linear kernel, works just as well. So you weight them so the more distant ones have a smaller weight, uh, and then you update X as the weighted average of all, all the points based on that weight. And this just has a tendency to push points closer to closer to the points to which it's already close, right? <laughs> and you can see intuitively how that should help bunch the points up into one single point. So I just needed to find this Gaussian thing here. I'm sure it's a built-in, but since he did it this way, I saw we'll do it. Um, and then, okay, plots it. Do I need this? No. And we all know what Gaussian is, so he did spend a little bit of time talking about Gaussian. It's kind of funny, the level of the presentation sometimes varies, like swings, like one way, like whoever is like target audience is, I'm not exactly sure, but they'll go into details about Greek letters and then like go blasting through something about, you know, clip interrogators or whatever. It's just like, okay. <laughs> You had a little little um, spiel on the the partial function too, and I think we we've seen that before. Oh, uh, but yeah. that's I always forget that that thing exists. Yeah, it's in funk tools. It's handy. It's quite handy. Um, and mainly, whenever you find yourself writing something like this, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I see a comment. You said her, but I was actually thinking that that was um, a functional, like what we call a. a or is it a functional or a function factory? I don't remember. One of those yeah. things in the head. It is. Yeah. yeah. But it's there is a thing in Per for doing this partial thing, unless I'm mistaken, right? I think it's in there. But yeah, Per's got a bunch of functional stuff and that's what it's for, isn't it? Yep. Well functional programming tool. You yeah. input a function <laughs> and output a I know I should know this. I'm gonna teach it. No, it is a functional it is a, yeah, you're in right, like two weeks. Function. I think it's a function factory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is a function factory. It's a function that takes a function and produces a function. So, uh, well, no, it's a function transformer, I guess. I actually, actually can't remember what the terminology was in that advanced art course either. Was it function? Function factories could be anything that produces functions. It doesn't necessarily have to take a function. It just takes some fixed parameters, right? Anyway, anytime you find yourself writing something like this, you know, look to use partial to simplify things a little bit easier, a little bit. That's all. Yeah, I think he used that in like one of the first couple lessons where he yeah. was doing another another plot, right? Where he just wanted to get the, I guess the 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 y value, if you yeah. will. I always forget about it too. I actually do end up running lambdas, and I don't know just. <laughs> Here's the um, little diagram. Okay. Yeah, I usually write an anonymous function. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in any event, now we want to try to do this, right? To do this. So we so he starts off by cloning the data just so he, we're gonna start we're gonna start modifying X to all the X points, right? We're gonna move all the X points closer to their neighbors, so to speak. And so we don't want we want to not mess up our original data set. So you use clone here to create a copy. And 
then he says, well, let's take one point, take the first point, why not? And we're going to start with that point. Where, how will this point be modified in one loop, one step of this process? And so remember what the process is. We need to subtract first. We got to find the distance. So that's just subtracting this point from all the points. And we can do that by just saying X minus X because of broadcasting of just work here. We don't have to worry about, we don't have to add any extra axes because everything's got the right shapes already. And by the way, I'm really lazy about this kind of thing. If I, why did this, when this generate button appear? <laughs> it's a new thing. I don't ever see that before. If, if I just try stuff like this and it doesn't work, let me just see if I can make a fail. So when I get something, oh, the shape didn't work. I just purposely made it not work by taking the transpose, right? The shape didn't work. I'm like, okay, then I'll look at the shapes and say, what's going on here? <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, I need to match that shape. We'll just make a match. That's that's basically been my strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, so the distance, which he now, this is another weird digression he takes, <laughs> but uh, apologies to um, to my to anybody really listening to this when I keep saying things like that. But it's not very. I'm trying not to be too dismissive, but I do think it's kind of these funny little digressions into mathematics um, are kind of funny. Like this one right here. So this is just simply we're taking the Euclidean, the two norm, the distance, right? We're all familiar with that, but then he says, hey, let's talk about norms. There's also all kinds of, you can generate have a general norm called an alpha norm, the one norm, whatever you want. So we know about those, but I just put that in there because he talked about it. In any event, this just works again because we now we can take this, we can sum it over the one axis, which we want, which is this axis, just summing the, well, sorry, squaring them. So this does an element Y, let's I'm just talk about this for a minute to make sure we understand it. You take the difference, Using broadcasting, we get it, something that looks like this, right? And then we're going to square element-wise every single element. So this just squares every element of this matrix. Just doesn't care what it is. The matrix will square every element. That's fine. Now, what I want to do is I just want to add them up along this axis, which is not the zeroth axis, but the, the one axis, right? The zeroth axis is the rows. The one axis is the columns in this case. Uh, wait, no, I can't be right. No, it's right. It's backwards from what you think. You specify the dimension you want to get rid of. Right. Yeah. I always get that confused. Yeah. Especially the dimension you want to get rid of. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> Again, this is one of the things you try and like, well, that didn't work. Let's try the other one. <laughs> okay. That worked. <laughs> but in any event, yeah. Summing over axis one gives you the sums of the, the squares. These are now squared. So we're just adding up across this, across the, the rows here. Um, and then take the square root. Again, element wise of all those. And that'll give us the, the distance. Straightforward. Uh, and then we can, well, we wanted those distances where we want to calculate the weights, so we can just take the element wise Gaussian of those, right? Um, and then we end up with weights. So this is 1500 weights that we've computed here. And what we need to do is take those weights and multiply them by X somehow. We want to weight each of these points by X and add them all up to get our new by X, the X matrix, by all the points to get our new little X, the point that we're trying to compute, right? The new point. So again, to do this, we're gonna have to, well, here you can see the shape. Well, let's take a look at this. Look at the shape of this one. This one's 1500, this one's 1502. Those aren't, those are incompatible according to the rules of broadcasting. We wanna be able to multiply these together element-wise. We have to do something to fix that. So we need to add in another axis onto the weight here. And that's what we're doing here. That's kind of how I think of it. I don't really think it through much further than that. So make the make it compatible, it'll work. <laughs> it seems like mm -hmm. and then check it later to make sure it actually did what I, I was supposed to do. That's been my approach. I probably should have spent some more time really studying these broadcasting rules to get it. He, he recommends this many times in the videos. And I, I need to do this because my kind of brute force approach is probably gonna might be hard someday, but <laughs> so hard it's been working. But I know that I want to multiply these two things on Y, so I just need to add an access to this one so that they're compatible again. Remember, to see if they're compatible, start from the right to the left, and they're compatible if the number, uh, the, the dimensions match, or if one of them is a one, right? Or if one of them is completely missing as you go further to the left, right? So you can have, you can have, you don't need the more on the left. There could be more numbers past the 15 on this side, as long as there's none over there. That still, that still matches. So that's all we have to do to multiply those two element-wise, and then we need to normalize that so we divide by the sum, right, of the weights. Oh, I didn't define all these things. I wasn't, wasn't working my way through this. 
So now we've got uh, the the weighted points. We're gonna oh, now all you have to do is add all these together to get our new x point. Man. So he puts all this. His oh, he mentioned this strategy when he's working with notebooks. I don't know why that's thing's doing that, but uh, is he likes to work through step by step by step and then copy paste everything down and make it into a function. That's all this is. Just making this into one function to make one update. And the thing that's different between this and this is, yeah, it does the sum. I didn't do the sum. I just wanted to see what all the weighted points would look like. But um, to find the actual final, the, the new point, we need to really sum. Now over the zero axis to get. Now, this is our new point that's been moved closer to uh, presumably a, a cluster. So we can do this for all the points, which is what's happening here. And we do, he just did five updates. So do five of those uh, updates. It's not terribly slow, you know, half a millisecond. And then and it does work. Okay, see, we're great. I guess I don't have this plot data function. So I skipped over that somewhere. Here it is. Here we go. So it works. After five iterations, all the points are essentially all, in the, all in these little dots. Uh, the little X's have been moved over by two diagonally, so you can see. If you take away the two, that you can't see the, the little dots where all the points are. <laughs> That's the point of that. Uh, then he does like, now the next little digression is about animation, um, which is kind of fun. Um, it's a useful thing to know how to do, right? You just need to import this uh, map. Plot. And as he said, it, actually, the documentation for this is not good. So the only way to do this is either search on uh, search Google and hope for to find the the best answer in uh, Stack Exchange, or I guess ChatGPT might be able to give you the right answer. Yeah, I wonder. But um, because the, some of it's kind of obvious, like how to do the animation, what's not obvious is what is th this thing? You know, why do I need this? But but it does work when you when you do it that way. You can see the points clustering down. Oops. Okay. Only five steps, so it's not a lot of frames here. But and so the the trick to doing these animations is you have to use this funk animation from the animation library. You define a function that creates one plot that you want, one frame. And then this thing will combine this little call that plot function uh, the number of times you have in the frames and create an animation from it. And then to show it, you can actually do other things too. They can export it as a as a MPEG or whatever if you want to save it. But you can also show it in the Jupyter notebook by using this magic function right here. It's apparently it takes the animation and turns it into a JavaScript HTML file, which you then can display with this HTML function. But I'm just saying words that. Makes sense. I don't, I'm not an expert in any of those things I just said. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any Sounds questions good. about that, that stuff? Nope. All right. So the last bit here is let's do, what can we do to speed this up? Right. We're not, uh, we're doing these one at a time and we're doing a lot of loops, right? And we're doing some broadcast, so it's not terrible. We're only doing, I guess, one loop. Right here. Well, we're doing two loops. One is through the updates, the other one's just through the data set. But can we get rid of that last loop? That's the question. And so he says, well, to do that, let's consider this doing this in batches. So he chooses a batch size of five just to get started. So we're going to do five uh, points at a time, essentially, rather than just doing one point at a time. Is there a way we can do that? So again, we're going to create a clone of the data, and we'll take instead of one point, we're going to take five points. So now we have uh, five points that we're going to try to simultaneously move closer to their corresponding clusters. So we need to simultaneously find for each of the five points uh, the distance to all the 1,500 points. That will be a 5 by 1,500 array at the end, right? Let's reach the five points. We have 1,500 distances. So the first step will be to do that subtraction, just like we did before. Uh, we just now we do have to do something to make the shapes compatible, because well the twos are compatible, fifteen hundred is not compatible with five. 
So we're going to have to, before we, we didn't need to do that because we had a one, right? So there's no problem. But now we need to stick a one in here to make that 1500 compatible. And that's what this does. This shows the shape in there, so it extends that shape. And it turns out the rules of this broadcasting are that you don't need, if they ever have a trailing colon, you can, you can leave it off. You never, you don't need it. It gets the same shape. So if I extend that by doing this, I get a five by one, two by two uh, tensor. And if I leave off the trailing thing, I still get a five, one, two tensor. It doesn't, it's not needed. It just assumes that's what you wanted to do. For X, uh, we could extend it. Like I said, it's, we really want, if we wanted to make it match better, we could extend it with a none, put a, put a extended axis on the front. But you don't need to do that because it always assumes, it'll always match on missing axes to the left. That's clear at all, I'm not sure. But, um, but now we can see that, look, two matches two, 15 matches one, because we're allowed to match to a one, and five matches a one. But five will also match nothing if we don't, we don't do this. And I point this out repeatedly because in the in the uh, video, he actually does put this none here. He forgets that you don't actually need to, it seems. So once again, now we can take the difference and sum over the last coordinate to get the distance squared along each coordinate, which is what we need. This is that 5 by 1500 uh, matrix. And we can put that into a function. We're going to call it distance B. So we, now we've gotten this down to one step. Uh, for any number of points we want to put in there, any batch size, we can calculate now the distances for each one of those points uh, from all the 1,500 points. That's what this uh, matrix is. And we turn those into a weight just by elementally wise sending it through a Gaussian. So that doesn't actually do anything to the shape. That's just the same shape transformed uh, from distances to weights. Now we have to do the last step, which is multiply the weights by the points so we can, and then add them all together. We're going to multiply all the weights by all the points and add them all together, right? So hopefully already you can see where this is going. If I want to multiply this matrix times this matrix and add them all together, that sounds like matrix multiplication already, right? <laughs> I hope you can see that this is a 5 by 15. I can multiply that by 15 by 2, and that's a perfectly valid matrix multiplication. But he did it a little more carefully than that. Um, he said, well, let's do the broadcasting so we can multiply the um, uh, well, this is it right here. We can, if we add it, all we need to do is add an axis at the end to make these compatible, right? And end of weight, I'm sorry. Uh, so then the two will match a one, the 1500 will match a 1500, nothing will match a five. It'll be compatible and then we can broadcast. And to add an axis on the end, you can use, he introduced, I don't know if he did this before, but he introduced at least again here, this triple dot notation which is another way of saying, hey, I want to put this at the end. All the other axes, the same, but I just want to add a new axis at the end here. So that I can, now I can multiply these together and I get this tensor of uh, this five by 1500 by two, which is what we need, right? We need uh, for each point, that's the five in our batch, we have the, the, uh, the, the uh, weighted, version of the other coordinates <laughs> of the other 1500 points. And I don't know sure the right way to say that is, but there's 1500 points we're going to add together to create our new X point for each five. That's what these are. These are the 1500 points we're going to add together because they've all been weighted. They're weighted versions of the 1500 points that are in the data. There's going to be some way to say that that sounds more coherent than what I'm saying, but you guys get what I'm saying, I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm following. <laughs> yeah, I'm barely following. I'm talking about now. So finally, we need to... Uh, sum up over the 1500, which we can do. And then we also need to weight them. So we can finally, we want to divide and we want to divide these by their weights. We better check again that they're compatible. turns out they're not. We need to you know, coordinate to, for the, for to let them broadcast properly. And this is something you just got to get used to doing. You just like adding these dummy coordinates over and over again. I don't know why this is something that can't be automated. I guess sometimes there's more than one way to make them compatible. And then that's, you know, that's one of those cases that's going to cause you problems. But this is now the new five points. That would be the end of the end of that one iteration through the mean shift clustering. So he says, wait a minute, we can just use Einsum to do this, right? Because all we're doing is anytime we're doing a, a multiplying together element wise and then summing, that's a good candidate for Einsum. 
And so he said, okay, this is the Einstein that will do that, right? Does the same thing again. And he said, hey, that's the Einstein for major multiplication. <laughs> Probably get to the point that we can just do this. And it's, it works fine. Let's multiply the weights times X and sum up, sum up uh, and divide by the, the norm, normalize it, right? This keep dim true, by the way, is just so that you can, this is the other way of doing what I was doing up here. Um, where was it? This. So here I was using broadcasting. I, if I did the sum with keep dim equals true, which I forgot about, then I wouldn't have done this uh, broadcasting to re, to reshape this array. It already, would already have the right shape, the denominator. So we're going to find this, combine all this into a nice little function, and it's faster. It's 40 milliseconds. What was it before? I want to say 400 milliseconds, something like that, wasn't it? Wow, I got to really scroll way up there. Yeah, about well, 400 milliseconds. So that's a factor of 10 just by moving everything, well, most things. Yeah, I moved too far. Yeah, into um, the broadcasting and using the built in matrix multiplication software. They still got a loop over the batches, um, but at least it's a little bit faster and over the iterations. So the final thing he does, let's move this onto the GPU. Maybe, I hope it looks good this time. Maybe it won't. I don't know about GPU stuff. Oh, there we go. 10 times faster. Um, so it's 100 times faster now than the native original Python version we have. And the native Python version, keep in mind, wasn't, was still using broadcasting. It wasn't just like, totally, I'm sorry, naive. It wasn't completely naive. We weren't just, we were using broadcasting. We weren't looping everything, but but still much faster now on the, on the GPU. Um, now you can, one thing, this is a, batch size of uh, 500, it turns out. You could use smaller batch size. So we use batch size of eight. I'm not gonna run it here, but it takes a while. <laughs> it slows it down a lot. So putting it all, uh, in fact, you just put it all, the whole thing, all 5,000 points on the GPU and just run it all one time. It's like three dollars seconds. On my GPU, all 5,000 all 5, points fit. And it's three dollars seconds to run the whole thing. So that's the exercise in trying to wrap your brain around these um, broadcasting rules and I sum and everything else. I think it just takes practice. I know I need a lot more practice. I could tell when I was talking through this, how much of it I didn't really internalize as well as I would hope to have internalized. So I need to do more practice on these things to get that more internalized. But I think that's the only way to do it is to, to do things like this. Uh, so at the end, uh, before I go to the end, does anyone have any other observations or questions or concerns about this section? No, I mean, I, I think his idea is pretty cool. Like the practical application, like, hey, like you might actually use a library now that doesn't utilize the the GPU and you might be able to just code it up yourself and get, you know, a pretty, Good. pretty big improvement to your runtime. That's, yeah, that's a great point. He did make that point. I, and that's, the idea is, yeah, if you'd, you'd be surprised, maybe something you're working on you didn't realize could be vectorized onto the GPU. And you just have to think, wait, am I just doing a bunch of multiplications and adding things together? Or maybe this could be done with uh, with broadcasting and with Einsam and speed up even faster with the GPU. So that was the homework, right? The homework was to go off and find some something like that and, and do that. He gave some suggestions. I didn't write them down, but um, to, to do that with. I'm not doing it. That's why I'm right. <laughs> you guys do it. Yeah. Tell me how it went. Okay, so we're reaching the end finally. Uh, so at the end, he talks about calculus. This is another case where he kind of steps back into some basic things. This is probably useful for a lot of people that don't have calculus background to do. So he just quickly goes through some of the basics, but he recommends the preparation for next week, which is going to be about backpropagation, presumably. Uh, to go and review this three blue, one brown series on the essence of calculus. Um, so that, that is if you're not familiar, you don't need to know integral calculus, but you should be familiar with what, how derivatives work, essentially, um, to understand how the back propagation works. But presumably you guys all are familiar with that, but maybe people watching this video, they need to review that so they can know how to take, I think you probably be, if you just knew how to take a derivative of a polynomial, they'd be very well for what's going on. Right, right, right. <laughs> and that's basically it um, for that week. Any other observations or concerns?
No, but, but yeah, that was great. great job, you know, walking through all this. Um, I apologize. It was a bit sloppy at times because I thought, again, it's one of those things where I went, and went through making those notes. I'm like, mm, I, I said, oh, yeah, this is all clear. I was just right now. And I'm like, actually talking through. I'm like, wait, how does this work again? <laughs> Why do you need to put a done here? Uh, so I, I revealed, to, revealed to myself that I need to study this some more. It's, just it's trial and error, like you pointed out. I mean, that's kind of kind of how I do things, too. I'm a, I'm a little worried, though, that you could potentially get it to work. But I, I think it's happening before you get it to work and get the wrong thing out. Yeah. But if you get it to work, you get the things to multiply, and then the shape of the result is what you expect. You're pretty confident that you're getting the right thing. And then you can just do some testing to make sure that it actually does. Yeah. Work. I was going <laughs> to say, that's why you have your test. Yeah. I'm basically test driven. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So next this week, great. Who's, who's, I'm up next. I think. Okay. So I haven't actually looked at the chapter yet, the video. But if the claim is it's going to be about back propagation and uh, right. MLP. What does that stand for? Multi layer, Multi -layer perception. perception. Yeah, just need oh, to know geez. your ch chain rules, right? Um, is this so? No one has taken on the responsibility for the following week after you, though. Yeah, it looks like. Yeah. So. Um, um,